Okay. Anyway, so uh, Ohegan started on the 19th and it goes to the 25th. Now, this happens twice a year. It happens during the fall and during the autumn. Uh, I mean, during the fall and during the spring around the equinox. And in East Asia, it's centered around examining and doing various practices like the six paramitas or six perfections, concentrating on the six perfections. And also it's a time in uh, East Asia in which people go on pilgrimages uh, quite often. And so it's a time to deepen one's, to deepen one's practice, the week long period. Uh, and so it's good for that. And it's a national holiday. As a matter of fact, right now in Japan is the national holiday. Is that correct, Sensei? Yes, Na yeah. national holiday, yes. So people, people are not going to work today, mm -hmm. theoretically. Um, and that's been from since the time of Prince Shotoku. So mm -hmm. that was very early. This idea of following that goes back to, to the 6th century, 6th, 7th century. And typically it's a time for self-reflection and memorializing one's deceased relatives by visiting and cleaning the grave sites, having memorial services performed, that sort of thing. And it's, it's interesting. And in Shishima sensei, I was just saying to, to Tamami a little while ago that we don't have any Sekihan. I was <laughs> uh -huh. looking for <laughs> this time of the year. We'd have, we'd have a lot of Sekihan at Tamunin. Uh -huh. we'll yeah, yeah, yeah. People will bring it for the altar. Um, and of course, anything that's put on the altar, the, the family of the temple has to eat. So uh, we would have a lot of Sekihan. Uh, sekihan is uh, red beans and rice. And uh, it's, a, it's, it's very tasty. Several points I'd like to make here about um, Ohigan is that self-reflection is an important aspect of this period of time. This one week long period of time is good for self-reflection. And it's really interesting because our, our Jewish friends had just completed Rosh Hashanah, the period of time from Rosh Hashanah to uh, Yom Kippur is also a time for self-reflection. So it's interesting how those two religious traditions really do the same thing. Um, I mean, obviously, Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur changed from year to year because of the lunar calendar. But nonetheless, that that's an important aspect of the Rosh Hashanah period. And it also make marking a time to do self-reflection, to, to set it aside. And I think this is true with Yosh, to Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And of course, Yom Kippur uh, is the cult, the culmination of that is uh, one's confessions to Hashem, to God, and then forgiveness. And I think that at this time of the year for um, Ohigan, the self-reflection, we set it aside as a time that's, that's very useful. In other words, on one hand, as Buddhists, we should be self-reflecting all the time. On the other hand, sometimes that happens and sometimes it doesn't happen. Um, the memorialization itself, the memorializations of one's deceased relatives is a means of showing gratitude to the fact that your ancestors, whether it's someone close to you, like your parents or your grandparents, but going back many generations, those people are the reason that you're alive. And just to show gratitude for giving one life is considered important. And gratitude is essential as part of this period of time. So one of the things that, that Ohigan really um, makes us concentrate on is self-reflection and gratitude. And as a matter of fact, when one is going to the tombs at this time of the year to clean one, the tombs around the, um, uh, for your relatives, 
that's that's showing gratitude. That's one way of showing gratitude for the relatives is by cleaning the tombs. You're remembering them and you're cleaning the tombs. And I found that in in the West, we tend not to do that. Um, and I don't exempt myself from that process, but I can tell you that since my parents live, since my, they don't live, since my parents are, are buried, thank you, in West Virginia, I never go to their grave because it's such a long distance away. And uh, I'm not going to take that trip. In Japan, you would be going to your ancestor's grave four times a year, New Year's, the two Ohigan periods, then during Obon. And, and I haven't been to my parents' grave since they were interred. Um, in my father's case was over 16 years ago, almost 17 years ago. And my mother, uh, <clears throat> 30 years ago. In Japan, that's considered to be um, something which is, is something people want to do. Although I have to say, and Ichishima Sensei could come on, comment on this, it probably is occurring less today than it was, let's say, 50 years ago, because more people have moved away from their hometowns and they may not have sufficient amount of time to go back to visit their, their ancestral graves. Uh, but in the past, that's always been very important. But it's, I think it's beginning to lose some of its importance today. I don't, is, do, you, do you notice that, Sensei? Yeah. Uh, this uh, Hingan period, uh, many people come to visit their tomb. Uh, you see, uh, our temple has also tomb around here. And so during the Ohigan service, uh, they will visit their tomb to uh, say hello to their ancestors. Uh, you know, the uh, I think uh, the equinox day means uh, uh, the sun uh, exactly rises from the east and set exactly to the west. So our ancestor, according to Buddhist uh, traditions, uh, will stay at in a very far western land. So. The, but the uh, so that day on equinox period, uh, their wishes can reach to their ancestors very straightly, uh, you know, not curved, just straight, like the sun set to the west, exactly uh, west part, you know. So uh, anyway, uh, spring. Um, <clears throat> Hingan is Shunbun no Hi, that is spring uh, period. And Shubun no Hi is this is uh, autumn. Uh, so uh, this Shubun uh, no Hi, everybody uh, <coughs> rest, not uh, work at the, uh, their companies. So, uh, and uh, also, I, you, you, your picture uh, presentation of uh, today's. Uh, uh, present. Uh, it uh, reminds me long time ago when I visit, visited <laughs> yeah. your temple. Yeah, this is, I think, barn, right? Before. Yeah, I was gonna, I'll mention that in a few minutes. Yeah. Oh, yes. Okay. That's from that. Well, and also during the, 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 during the equinox period, the days mm -hmm. and the nights are of equal length. And Ichishima Sensei was, was discussing that. And so from a Buddhist perspective, it's perceived that the seasonal transi transition is when the distance between the world of the living and the world of the dead are in closest proximity. And it's thought that, and, and the term ohigan is actually derived from the, from the Sanskrit para. Mm. And para is crossing over to the other shore. Mm. And so it means nirvana, the pure land, the realm of the deceased loved ones, it depends upon the school of Buddhism. Pure land would use as a pure land. <clears throat> Tendai views it as both pure land as well as, <clears throat> excuse me, as Nirvana. The, the Zen schools would say Nirvana. Uh, but certainly from a, from a vernacular perspective, it's when the living, the, the world of the spirits and the world of the living are in closest proximity. 
And so as a result, in Japan, the Sagaki ceremony, which is the feeding the hungry ghost ceremony, is done during Obon, either in July or August, depending upon where in Japan one happens to live. And at that time, that's when the Sagaki ceremony is done. And we made a decision when we first came here, uh, you know, 26 years ago, 27 years ago, as of next month, that we would be doing this during the Ohigan period, Sagaki, during Ohigan, and for that very reason, because that's when the spirits are in closest proximity to us. And the picture, and, but we haven't, we didn't do it in the last year. We didn't, we're not doing it this year because we're not gathering the way we would normally gather. Um, the picture that you see on the handout, did everybody download the handout? If you didn't, oh, it's, it's, you just missed this magnificent picture. <laughs> but that picture is, that was a picture of Ichishima Sensei and I doing the Sagaki ceremony in 1998 uh, in the old Hondo, which was in the horse park. Um, and we, we had a Sagaki Don made specifically to fit our Hondo at that time. Now we can have a larger one, but we got a, we've got the Sagaki Don, so there's no reason to make a new one. Um, and that's a, that's a picture of a Sagaki ceremony that was done back in 1998 uh, with Ichishima Sensei here. Um, and just to let you know that the Sagaki ritual originates with the Buddhist story found in the Ulambana Sutra. And in the Ulambana Sutra, Mahamagliyana, one of the disciples, chief disciples of, of um, uh, Shakyamuni Buddha had had a dream in which his mother was portrayed in the dream and she's hanging upside down with a swollen belly and a pencil thin neck. And so Mahamagliana had, had asked uh, Shakyamuni Buddha, I had this dream about my mother. What does it mean? I, I don't understand. And um, Shakyamuni Buddha explained to him <clears throat> that his mother had been, is in the realm of the hungry ghosts, the, the, the gaki. And in that realm, she went there because, and the story goes, when her husband had died, she had been instructed by the husband to take all of his wealth. And she was a relatively wealthy woman, or he was a wealthy man. And to distribute the money, one third for the wife, one third for the children, and one third to the Buddhist Sangha. And she kept all the money for herself and didn't distribute it to her children, didn't distribute to the, to the uh, Sangha. And so she was a hungry ghost. In other words, the hungry ghost has a pencil thin neck indicating that though they may be hungry, when they try to swallow, the food doesn't go down and their belly is swollen because as you've seen children who are, who are starving, they have a swollen belly. And however, they're attracted to incense and they're attracted to the various things that one puts on the Sagaki Don. And so that's where that, the Sagaki ceremony actually was derived from, was that particular sutra, the Ulambana Sutra. So we hope that in future years, we can commemorate, we can, we can once again hold the Sagaki ceremony as we've done every year. Um, Susan, I think we did hold it in 2019, didn't we? Mm -hmm. Because I think I remember that um, uh, we did it for Philip. You're, you're muted, Susan. Last year we did it. Oh, last year we did it. Yeah, that's right. We did it in, we did it in, in 2020. So we did it in 2020, right? Yeah. Um, and normally we would do it when we had a, when we would have a retreat. We'd have a retreat, and we would do it at that that Sunday of the retreat. That would be the normal the normal way we would do it. Um, and here's a question that I have, and I want to open this up for discussion. We have reached a point in which now more people have died from COVID than died in the pandemic of 1918 in the United States. 
Stop and think about that. The worst plague in the history of the United States occurred in 1918. And we've now exceeded the number of people who have died from the plague in 1918. And recently we, we commemorated 9-11 as an example in which there were 3,000, approximately 3,000 people who died in the Twin Towers and in the, the field in Pennsylvania and in the Pentagon, approximately 3,000 people. And we, many ceremonies were held to memorialize that particular uh, event. And I'm wondering if as we, as Buddhism begins to mature in North America, if perhaps the COVID deaths and those who are disabled as a result of the long COVID, if that might be, begin to be incorporated within the Sagaki ceremony that we do in North America. What do, what do people think about that? Does that sound like something that is worthwhile or? You should wake up, Chip. <laughs> I'm, 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 looking, I'm looking for input. This isn't, isn't uh, yes, Jake. Jake, yeah, you're yeah, muted. Yeah, I think that maybe like the, it should be something where maybe the first time, like after like when, when it's actually able to be held again, that uh, maybe during that time it's worth doing something, but I feel like it should kind of um, maybe be one of those things where if there's where maybe whatever happened during that year where there were a lot of deaths involved, maybe that can be the thing for each year. Yeah. Okay. What do other, what do other people think? Both here and no opinions. I think we should, but the question is how do we do it? How to do it? Well, that's that's always. I mean, that's something that when we say how do we do it, that is something that we develop. How do we how do we take a the ritual that we have? I mean, the Sagaki ritual is relatively well laid out. We know exactly what you do during the Sagaki ritual. But there's always an opportunity to add things to it. And so it's possible to, and I don't know how, what that would look like at this point. That That is the cause for a discussion, I think, in many cases. But it's a sort of thing where we begin to look at it and say, how do we, how do we begin to memorialize that? And, and part of the the reason that I think it's even more important is we've exceeded the number of deaths from 1918, but in the last 100 years, there have been so many improvements in medicine and so many improvements in our knowledge of viruses and, and how to treat vi viruses. And yet we never learned from 1918. I remember that there was a, a very famous experiment, natural experiment that was done because I think it was Philadelphia had resisted a mask mandate. The political leaders in Philadelphia in 1918 said, no, we're not gonna wear masks. I mean, there were no vaccines available at that time for, um, for the, the, the flu, but Another city, St. Louis, had put in place a mask mandate. And they had, it was a- It was a parade or something. Was it yeah, a huge celebration? Right. And the number of people that died in Philadelphia contrasted the number of people who died in St. Louis. There was a, an incredible difference between those. In other words, we learned from that natural experiment, so to speak, well, let me rephrase okay. that. We, we have information from that natural, that natural experiment, but we didn't learn anything from it. Maybe that's the best way to put it, you know? And so when we view this particular uh, pandemic, I have to say that to a very large extent, while it's a natural occurrence to have uh, infection and to have the results of that, we have, ignored 
the best information. And as a result, literally hundreds of thousands of people have died that otherwise would not have had to die. And so I think that that's part of the memorialization process is to keep that in the mind. I remember at the beginning of this pandemic, people had no idea of the, the pandemic in 1918. And I, I used to teach in my courses, right? And I would, te- I would, I would be teaching it to the kids. And I said, do you realize that in 19, this is long before this pandemic, you realize in 1918, hundreds of thousands of people died from a flu in the United States. They'd never heard of it. It was something totally unknown, you know? So, and that's why I'm saying memorializing things like that have a place in, in trying to keep it in people's minds. Yes, Joe. Yeah, so I have uh, two questions. One is, uh, I, I see the idea of and the importance of memorializing those people who have died because of um, the pandemic or the COVID. But do we have an incidence of memorializing particular group of people during Sagaki? Well, in, in other words, why do we have to memorialize in Sagaki? That's question okay. number one. Another question is, right, I, I would like you to clarify right, um, the distinction between the following two things. One is Sagaki, if I understood you correctly, was originally meant to meant, meant to be a, for the um, how do I say this to praying for uh, to, uh, for the hungry ghosts, right? Yes. But eventually, it became a, a general category, not necessarily for hungry hungry ghosts. And we don't want to say that those people who died during the COVID are now hungry ghosts. Okay, hmm. that, those are those are both good questions. Um, the, the answer is by explaining a little bit about the Sagaki ceremony itself, and that is that you do the Sagaki ceremony, and you're attracting all the hungry ghosts, and you do it with incense. You place food items that the person in their life, your relative, may have liked during their lifetime. It would attract them. Um, maybe, maybe a bottle of Asahi beer, <laughs> you know, you would put there. Um, and typically in Japan, especially for the people who have died within the last year, that's the, the tradition. So you're doing it for the people who have died in the last year. And by doing so, what you're saying is in the event that your relative, whomever it may have been, had found him or herself in the gaki, as a gaki in that realm, the hungry ghost realm, you don't have to stay there. You've now been informed that you can come out and the ceremony is to assist them in coming out from from that hungry ghost world. Now, that's not to say that you know that your relative is a hungry ghost. You don't know. It's in case. But it's, it's a way of, 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 number one, recognizing their death during the last year. Number two, it's a way of, in the event that they are a hungry ghost, you're taking them out of that, that realm, that hungry ghost realm. Now, when we, do the, when we do the Sagaki here, just because... W- we're not in Japan, so I've expanded it to include others than just those who are have died in the last year. We include people who may have died five years ago or, or longer, you know, uh, especially the memorial years that we would find, uh, you know, the, the memorial years that are normally remembered, uh, one, three, seven, et cetera. Um, I, did, was there another question? Think, was that both was that answer to both questions? No, the, the other question is why do we need to create a category of its own? Right. Uh, in see. other words, or that did we have an incident, uh, a similar incident of creating a category of its own and commemorate, commemorating them 
not as just some as uh, those who died right. pre during the previous year, but through a specific uh, cause. Right. Well, I, I guess I guess what I was thinking is there's it's not like 9-11 in which there was one date in which you had everyone dying at once or more or more or less at once. We can look at 9-11 and say, OK, this is a date to memorialize them. The question is, when when would we memorialize for something that happened over a two year period or a three year period and, and choosing to do it maybe during Sagaki, during oh, during Ohigan and doing it as part of the Sagaki might be a way to choose a date that that's the only that's all I'm saying. The other thing is, right now we seem to have a um, pandemic of the unvaccinated primarily. And that seems to me like hungry ghosts. <laughs> of those unvaccinated people that are now dying from the COVID seems to me to be almost like a hungry ghost situation. Um, so, but that's just, you know, that's an, that's an additional thought on it. That's all. So, are there, yes, go ahead, Ushi. Yeah, I was curious. Uh, in Japan, younger generation observes uh, all of these things, Ohigan, and uh, they go to the temples and <clears throat> clean the graves of their um, ancestors and all of that. Or do they do what people in other religions in the modern world do is ignore everything. <laughs> well, I, I, I think what I said before was that now people are less likely to be observant of that because they live farther away from their ancestral graves, etc. I mentioned that early on. And so you're right. I mean, younger people are less likely to, to participate. But I would say that if your family had a family member lost this last year and you were 25 years old, you're still going to go with mom and dad to your grandfather's cigar. Yeah, okay. I got it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Uh, I also wonder to what extent as, as one ages that they start to think about their own mortality and yeah. realize like, I better do this for my family if I expect my family to do it for me. Yeah. In the same way that a lot of religious institutions or religious traditions find people becoming more spiritually involved or religiously involved as they age because they start to face these things. Did, er did everyone hear that? Mm -hmm. OK. OK, good. Um, yeah, I, I think that that's true. As we get older, we recognize our mortality more and we're more likely to be observant of those things, you know? That's natural, that's a, a natural phenomenon. Um, let me just go on and finish this up. Um, the other point that I want to make is moving away from sort of the, the, the Ohigan observances and, and specifically as we observe it here, which was uh, Sagaki. There's always been a transition of the seasons from heat to cool, from summer green to flowering, uh, to orange, autumn, yellow, red, dormancy. Um, and this year, Ohigan, during this pandemic, seemed more poignant than years in the past for me. I'm just speaking for me now. During my reflections this year, I felt a greater transition than I felt in previous years. Normally, I look at things like the swallows coming and going as a transition between the seasons. I look at the, sa the sound of the peepers. I look at the lightning bugs. I look at the leaves changing. Those are all signs of that transition, you know, between summer, fall, et cetera. This year, it seemed to be more, more profound than it has in the past. And I personally have felt like this Ohigan period has been more of a, even more of a transition than normal. And I just found that really interesting. I've been reflecting on it. 
and I see greater transition taking place. And I think part of the transition I see taking place is also in the social milieu. And this year we went from a feeling of liberation from restrictions sometime at the beginning of the summer. We thought, oh man, okay, we're moving on. And then bam, the Delta virus emerged. And now we're sitting here with masks on again and socially distancing, even when vaccinated. And when you're vaccinated, you have to now worry, am I going to pass on the Delta variant? Uh, because we, know, without going into the technical things, we know that even vaccinated, you can carry uh, a greater viral load, with the, especially with the Delta variant. And so I, I think that that's been part of what's been happening, at least to me, during this particular Ohiga. And I think about the three truths as one truth. The mundane or the provisional realm is neither alike nor different from the absolute of shunyata. And alike refers to the real truth, shunyata, and different refers to the mundane or the provisional truth. And the phrase in its entirety is, refers to the middle path. And the explanation of the threefold truth has already been clarified to the point, and I'm quoting this, the explanation of the threefold truth has already clarified the point that truth is one. The two truths are non-dual. Reality is an integrated unity. And I guess what I was trying to state previously, this feels more profound because we had the absolute on one hand, and the, and the provisional on the other. And we've had to recognize the middle way that there is no, that they are neither alike nor different. They're the same and yet they're not the same. And to me, the Ohigan, the equal light and the equal night is like that middle way. I, I, it seems to me that it became a very visual, concrete example of the three truths as one truths doctrine. And we've been buffeted from one extreme in our social and interpersonal lives, and we've been attempting to find the middle path. What is the middle path as we get buffeted back and forth, back and forth? And we've been adjusting as best we can. And I remember there was a term that came from Daniel Defoe when he was asked, uh, Daniel, I shouldn't say when he was asked, Daniel Defoe wrote the plague years. It was about the bubonic plague in 1665, although it wasn't published until 1772, I believe was the date. But in there, there's a, a response that he was asked, well, what was life like during the bubonic plague? And he said, life is life. There is no difference. You're right. living, that's life, whether it's during the plague or it's not during the plague. And to me, that really has a meaning of the three truths as one truth. And finally, I'm going to leave with Shunyu Suzuki, who said, the goal of our life's effort is to reach the other shore, nirvana. Prajna Paramita, the true wisdom of life, is that in each step of the way, the other shore is actually reached. And I think that that is a really profound statement. So do we have any other questions or answers or comments? I'm looking back at this, yes. This whole um, practice and construction of um, Sagaki service, how does that stand in contrast to say the Tibetan practice uh, uh, in the Bago state uh, of helping someone, assisting someone through that period after that? Is that a means of escaping from the uh, Gafi realm? Is it in any way contrast with that? Well, the, the instructions during the Bardo state are to assist the person to be reborn into a good rebirth, 
okay, so that you don't end up in the Sagaki in the Gaki world in the hungry ghost world as an example. Um, the so that and, and and by the way, there is is something similar to that within Tendai. There's forty the forty nine days. Each of the days has a specific set of prayers for the deceased. And during the 49 days, which is made up of seven weeks, there's a separate deity which is leading that particular week. Um, and so that process is to assist the deceased in having a good rebirth. The Sagaki is the person could have died a year ago. And so it's not related to that Bardo period of 49 days. Uh, could have died a year ago, could have died last week, but whenever the Sagaki is done is within the last year, typically. Or now we extend it even further and go back. And part of the reason we do that, by the way, is because we've only been here for 26 years. Somebody may have died 50 years ago, but we're still appealing for that person who died 50 years ago. Um, so there, there's a similarity in the sense that you're, that there is a type of intercession being attempted, but the difference is that one in terms of the instructions during the 49 day period is for a good rebirth. The Sagaki is specifically to assist one who's been reborn as a hungry ghost. That's, that's a distinction. Complementary, but distinct. Right. They're complementary, but they're distinct. Exactly. Are there any other questions or thoughts, comments? Anyone back here? Oh, you're a white chip. Good. It's good to see. <laughs> what about what about up here? No. Well, if that's the case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask these folks to go out to the hondo. Thank you. Well, let me give a very brief Dharma talk. The discussion this evening. I mentioned that Ohigan is a time of self-reflection. And self-reflection is common to most spiritual pursuits. Within the spiritual context, self-reflection is not what is meant by the vernacular term as it's used in psychologized societies. The contemporary model, the popular use of self-reflection is defined as a mental process you can use to grow your understanding of who you are, what your values are, and why you think, feel, and act the way you do. And I think that's a, a pretty good definition of that. And that's very useful. I'm not in any way impugning that. That's a useful thing to do. But it's not what is meant by self-respect, self-reflection in spiritual terms. That's a different, that's a different type of process. And it's not meant what I meant by self-reflection regarding Ohiyan from the time of Prince Shotoku. In this case, we could use in the case of, of, of self-reflection in the spiritual context, we often use the term wise attention. And I'll paraphrase Dr. Ari Ubisakara in Buddhist teaching, wise attention is a central and key factor of the path to liberation that helps a practitioner attain insight and wisdom. And that's quite different from the idea of understanding who you are, what your values are, etc. According to Buddhist text, wise attention is used in the enlightenment process. Through wise attention, one can focus, analyze, comprehend, and realize the true nature of all physical and mental phenomena, impermanence, anika, unsatisfactoriness, dukkha, and absence of self, anatta. By directing attention to the essence or heart of the matter, and by penetrating beyond the superficial appearance of conditioned phenomena. That's what is meant by self-reflection for the Ohigan period. In other words, <coughs> excuse me, from a Buddhist perspective, self-reflection is not a better understanding of the provisional self. It is insight into the nature of the conditions of existence that go beyond the mundane self. 
one of the ways we move from self-reflection to compassion is through gratitude. And for this, I would like to use the pledge from the Jodo Shinshu minister, Kojun Otani. And here I quote him. Reaching out to others, I will share a smile and gentle words, just like the Buddha who always calls out with aloha. He's obviously from Hawaii. Breaking away from my greed, anger, and ignorance, I will try to live in peace and harmony, just like the Buddha who shares tranquility and kindness with all. Moving forward from self-centeredness, I will share a life of joy and sorrow with others, just like the Buddha whose caring heart always embraces us. Realizing that I live because of others, I will strive to live life to the fullest with an attitude of gratitude, just like the Buddha who promises to embrace us all. Svaha. And I think that during this Ohigan period, you've got several more days of it and make good use of them. Be reflective within the spiritual context and live this as a period of gratitude Use it as a period of humility, of harmony, and service to others. And I thank everyone for your attention.